first have to say I have no conflict of interest. Uh, however, I am not a typical orthopedic surgeon since I do, do not have any mistresses. <laughs> So, first, again, I will do as you. I will give you some history of spine surgery. And if you look at disc herniation, the first laminectomy was presented to be performed in 1829 already. And in the 1909, Krause described to do a removal of a disc herniation, or actually it was an enchondroma, but probably this is the description of the first disc herniation surgery. The same year, Alfred Taylor described how to perform unilateral laminectomy. And you can see his drawing to the right. It's quite nice how he described this in, in all different regions of the spine. We all know about the paper on Mixter and Barr in 1933, uh, where they presented disc herniation and suggested that surgical decompression should be the preferred treatment. And after this, lumbar discectomy became one of the most frequent surgeries performed by neurosurgeons. If we jump to the 1977, the first time uh, Yasser Gil described for the first time using microscope for disc herniation. And there were other improvements, having smaller incisions, smaller instruments. And in 83, as you already described, there was an introduction of percutaneous endoscopic lumbar discectomy. And this has been, been proved by different people. And uh, 2006, Rutten et al. described the full endoscopic technique, pretty much what is done today, but there are still improvements. I'll also give you a little bit of spinal fusion history. Already 1911, spinal fusion was described for patients with tuberculosis. And you can see on the, on the drawing to the right, in the paper from Yama in 1911, how they used the spinous processes to make the fusion. 1925, Campbell described to use to, to dis, do dissection of the transverse processes and use ilia crest bone. 44, the first plift was described using bone chips, and Clower described to put the bone construct to make it more stable in 53. We have the introduction of pedicle screws, and I will not go on and tell you all about the X lift and plift and plift and everything we have, and now end, endo lift too. But there is a continuous improvement or change in methods. So if we look at how this is seen from the industry side, this is a, a prediction of 2020, what kind of different things we, we put in the spine. And you can see that a quarter of this circle is uh, plifts, cliffs, a-lifts, and so forth. So quite small uh, implants that we used to put in the disc. And probably we will have either more different options, but they also, think that if you look, this is a prediction for 2014 to 2021, and what is increasing the most, the industry is predict that is the miss, the minimal invasive spinal surgery for fusion. So definitely for the past 100 years, spine surgery has gone through a continuous development towards less invasive and more precise techniques. And I think we will continue to move in this direction. The question is how we do this and where we are today. First, I want you all to remember when we are comparing different techniques, we have to keep in mind the major challenge in spine surgery is still to select the patients that benefits from surgery at all. But that is not the topic of my talk. So we go back to the lumbar spine surgery. What do we want to achieve? We want to achieve decompression of neural structure in different pathologies, stabilization of unwanted mobility, like trauma, tumor, degenerative, Sometimes we want to do corrections. These are the main thing we want to achieve. So when we are introducing new methods and techniques, we, I think we have to ask ourselves three main questions. The first question is, can we address the pathology and achieve the desired result with this new technique? Meaning, in the lumbar spine, can we get sufficient decompression, obtain a bone effusion, get enough correction? Whatever we want to do. If the answer is yes to this question with the new method, we can move on to the second question. Do the new method cause increased risks, more pair or postoperative complications? And there is a variety of those, and we heard about that. But also, do we introduce any new problems or new risks, like radiation dose? That could be harmful both for the surgeon and for the patient. So if you can say no to this question, 
we can move on to the third question. Is there any other pros and cons for the new method? For example, time for hospital stay and recovery, and costs for the patients or for the society? And factors as tissue damage, blood loss, may of course influence these factors. But remember, this is the third line question to ask. So what are then the answers to these questions when we compare open surgery with endoscopic surgery for the lumbar spine? I found about 10 systematic reviews and three meta-analyses for disc herniation, endoscopic versus open surgery. And the three meta-analyses uh, published in the last two years are these. They are based on the first one, seven studies, two RCTs, the second one, 23 studies, five RCTs, and the third one, nine RCTs. You can see that the first one, that's, you cannot get information about everything you want to know in all of them. And in the second one, they state that only seven out of 23 have an independent assessment of outcome parameters. Also in the RCTs, there is some, some lack of information for some of the things we want to know about. So what do they conclude in these meta-analysis? Well, for outcome, they conclude that the functional outcome is similar. The satisfaction is somewhat better, as we just heard. Overall, however, the satisfaction is, is high. They also conclude that the complications and reoperations, there was no significant difference. Others, well, there is less blood loss and shorter hospital stay in endoscopic surgery. Remember, this is the third line. And about complications and reoperations, in many of the studies that these meta analyses are based on, they were not powered to look at this. So for the last meta analysis, I just quote what they uh, write in the end. They write, these results require further investigations and validation, but adequately powered randomized prospective studies. We have some information, but it's quite limited still. So if we move on to more to PLIF, TLIF, or XLIF, and look into that. I, I left out the spinal stenosis because there is not much in the literature about endoscopic uh, procedures there. Well, still, there is many questions to be answered when we talk about these procedures. We still struggle. Should we do surgery or conservative treatment? Which patients? If we have instrumentation, we know that this if increase the fusion rate, but not necessarily the outcome. And there is no, date, no clear data on which type of procedure we should use. However, if we just leave this out for now and decide we want to do PLIF, TLIF, XLIF, something like that, do we want to do it open or minimally invasive? And I was happy I found four meta-analyses here in the last three years. So I thought, good, there will be some information. However, these are based on three RCTs in total 172 patients. Of course, there's other studies, cohorts and retrospective studies. So what is the summary from these three RCTs in these meta-analysis? Well, no differences in outcome. In complications, no differences, but a higher rate of revisions and readmissions for, me, for minimally invasive surgery. This is a bit contradictory. So what is positive for the minimally invasive surgery? Well, again, less blood loss, shorter hospital stay. On the other hand, there is also some negatives. There is more radiation. But again, this is the third line. So when we start something new, introduce a new method or a new implant, we should do this stepwise. That means that we first do some experimental testing. We start with small series of patients. After that comes the RCTs and the cohort studies, or the cohorts and then the RCTs where we look at follow up, a certain follow up time on the outcomes. After that, we need to do usage studies, follow our patients, and a good thing to do is to use registers for that. Of course, this takes some time to gather this data. And on the same time, there is also a demand from the industry selling things to us. Even if it's, just, if it's a method, there is instruments, and when do they gain the money, can earn the money for this? Well, if you look at the red line, that's how we increase a new technology comes, a new method comes, and then it gets more mature, and after a while, usually it declines, because we are usually a bit too positive in the beginning. But when is the profit made? If you look at the green line, you can see that most of the profit is actually made early. So they want us to jump on the train early, because that's where they can earn money. 
And we need to remember both these things before we jump on the train. So is there any other ways to evaluate treatment scientifically that may be of help? And I would like to spend a minute on this because I think this is what we need to do. I think we need to do registry-based randomized clinical trials. The, these are excellent if you want to compare two existing treatments in use. You need to have a simple hypothesis for these type of studies to work. One question. So if you have a quality register, you can enter, decide what kind of baseline data you want to enter and have the randomization performed by the register. And then you collect the data as usual in the register, and you, if you already have that set up. And then you can work in different centers, all using the same register, and you can easily get much more patients and good powered studies to do this. And I really hope we'll see these studies performed for comparison of treatment methods in use for spinal pathologies. So the question was, when should we do open surgery? Well, if we look primarily how, when, we, when we should do this, I think we should, of course, do it when for pathology not possible to address by minimally invasive surgery. Also, if we have pathology with similar outcomes, there is certain times you need to do it if there is an unclear pathology or anatomy, if it's not first time surgery in that area, and maybe most important, the surgeon do not have the sufficient training for the procedure, the learning curve. You, we have to remember that not everybody is as good as the people doing the randomized controlled trials. This, all these things make the risk increase, and we always have to, to weigh the risk and the benefit. They might, the, the risks for lumbar spinal surgery, we know there is many risks. And we also have to remember that the risks vary between different levels in the spine, between different methods, and also if it, they can be influenced by the pathology or the patient characteristics. And I think this picture by Mobs et al. is quite good because it depends on where you come in, what things are in your way and, and where you have to be careful. And also remember, risks does not disappear just because we do not see them. So if we go for something minimally invasive, sometimes we need to convert to, to open surgery. And when is that? Well, if the pathology cannot be reached as planned or if the visualization is too poor, if we get some complications, for example, a dual tear or something else that we need to address. So either the original pathology or a complication cannot be addressed, then of course we have to go for open, open surgery. The job needs to be done. So in summary, I was going to ask when are open spine techniques for the lumbar spine preferred? Having all this evidence, but there is some evidence for minimally invasive and for endoscopic surgery, I still think the answer is in most patients undergoing lumbar surgery today. Why? Why do I say that? Open surgery is still the gold standard, and any new method needs to show similar outcome without any increase of risks. And remember, most of the studies were underpowered to look at the risks. There is a learning curve for any new surgical methods, and we have to take that account, into account. We should not introduce new risks if there is no clear benefit. And here I think especially about the radiation. So as surgeons, how should we act? I think we need to evaluate new methods in a scientific-based way, stepwise introduction and follow-ups. Our patients deserve that. Sorry. We need to evaluate the risks individually for every patient. And very important, make sure you can do the job with the chosen method, not just that someone can do it in a center where they are specialized and do thousands of these. Uh, if you just do a few, it might be very, very tricky. Try to do as little tissue damage, tissue damage as possible. I agree on that. We should try to do t as little as possible. We may, may, might save some money and some time. However, when in doubt, choose the safest alternative. Patients are not experimental material. And if perioperative problems occur during any minimally invasive surgery, we always have to consider to convert to open surgery. We need to have an alternative A, B, and C. So having said that, we should 
of course, stick to science-based medicine. And that means that we have to have scientific methods, but also 100% curiosity. I appreciate that. And remember, one size does not fit all. And we also have to care. Having said that, I also want to throw in a little bit of Hill, Hill Street Blues wisdom, if you remember that police series. I think we have to all, let's be careful out there. Thank you. <laughs>